4215. Are they real? We check out the work of artist Stuart Johnson. Grab a couple paddles for a ride down the Rancocas River, then it's off to the skies. It's the 100th anniversary of aerial refueling. And we close with something we all know and love, a 215 flashback fave. Welcome into the 215, I'm Breland Moore. Mike Jarek has the night off tonight, but we are going to explore Fort Mifflin this evening. It's right near Philadelphia International Airport, and it is one of the oldest forts in America that's still standing. We're gonna take you all through it and learn about over three centuries of American military history. But first things first, we wanna to get to our first story of this evening. So it's a museum, an arboretum, and a sculpture garden all in one. You might have seen some of these sculptures up in Northeast Philadelphia, but where are they made? Well, we've gotta go beyond the 215 to New Jersey. It's a really magical place. It's a different kind of museum. We are a 42-acre garden and arboretum with about 300 sculptures interspersed throughout the experience. Groundster Sculpture was founded by uh, artist uh, and philanthropist Seward Johnson. And so one of the core parts of our collection is Seward Johnson's sculptures, uh, which include a series of sculptures of everyday people that kind of catch you by surprise. Is that a real person? I am responsible for Seward Johnson's creative legacy. Seward was a magical person. He had big ideas and somehow always brought them to life. This is a sculpture of Seward Johnson. This is exactly an outfit he would wear. A signature hat, signature jacket. When it comes to his artwork, it's a little bit more subtle. Sometimes it's humorous, but it's always vulnerable. Sometimes he would have given us ideas or he would have asked us to do something and it seems so wild and somehow we always rose to the occasion and I think that's what we're still doing. We're still rising to the occasion. So if an artist comes to us and says that they're interested in doing something, I think our first response is usually like, yeah, let's try to figure out how to do that. And it's no different with Donnie from Mayfair. Born and raised in Mayfair, uh, been here my whole life. I just love the neighborhood, so that's why I'm here and still here. She told me that the statues have been all over the world, but they've never been to Philadelphia. I'm like, well, let's do it. We have nine pieces here that are scattered along our corridor. It's a walking tour. Surreal. <laughs> that's what grabbed me right away. This was the first time I saw a sculpture that was painted to look like a real person and looks like a real person. She looks like she's getting ready to walk out in the street, and so many cars slow down. The owner there, Patrick, told me that he's had people come up and try and walk this woman across the street. Like, that's how real she looks. Love the postman. I come that way every morning to work, and I wave to him. And the person that's riding in my car with me, she waves and catches herself. She got me again. When the work went, goes out to a place like Mayfair, it creates its own story in that place. I see a kid sitting on his daddy's shoulders watching a parade go by. The little old lady sitting on the bench. The businessman having a conversation. The guy running to catch a bus because he don't drive. The soldier with the little girl running into his arms. My son was in the military, so that, that brings up something. We do exhibitions because Stuart really believed in the power of connectivity and getting these artworks out there and creating conversations, getting people outside, getting people to really embrace and love where they live. In the last six months, I have seen strangers interacting with each other, stopping, taking pictures, selfies, and speaking to one another complete and total strangers having conversations and such a nice interaction to see this because we don't see it that much anymore. So for more information on Grounds for Sculpture, you can visit their website right here at the bottom of your screen. Well, one of the best kept secrets about our area is the amount of outdoor activities that you can do. And to prove that, our photojournalist Brian Zeli grabbed a kayak and a camera and some friends and headed out on the Rancocas River. <laughs>
Thanks for everyone for coming out. For Art. Hi, Art. Hi. <laughs> For planning this, he has, these are part of art adventures. Every year he has one or two big adventures that we have and uh, does a great job and everyone participating. Fun on the river. Today is our second trip on this at the full so from start to finish, from mile marker zero to mile marker 14, from Pemberton, Burlington County Community College, to Mount Holly, which is 14 mile run. On this trip, we had 18 people, like I said, with a collaboration of three different groups. Leg two. Leg two. Leg Into two. the abyss. <laughs> This is when the obstacle course starts. Yeah. River, you are a beautiful dog. I'm having a blast. Yeah, it's nice. Nice and beautiful. Yeah. It's why we're here. End of October. Yeah. Most people would probably look at us like we're crazy, you know, coming, floating under a bridge, yeah. crawling out of the creek. Why do you do this? Oh, it's just so much fun to do it. First, it's a camaraderie with all the fellow kayakers and just to be out in nature and enjoy what you can when you can. Why do you guys do this? Passion. <laughs> we love the paddle. It's kind of like uh, Go Dogs Go, you know? Dr. Seuss, Go Paddlers Go. It's funny. <laughs> it's like they're going every which way. It's pretty funny. Mostly everybody did come today. Is not was not a, actually a beginner. They you know they have some experience in paddling, and most of the ones that come out on a trip that I host like this as an adventure paddle, they already know what they're in for when they start. Um, those people accept it and they understand it's going to be a long day. It, it's not going to be an easy paddle. You're definitely going to get dirty. You're definitely going to get muddy, and you, at point once at one point you're definitely going to get wet. Adventure paddle to me is when there's probably more than a handful of obstacles. And you know you're going to come upon them and you're going to have to face them one way or another. It's not a le leisurely paddle down the waterway where you're able to just paddle on through with no problems. A lot of times when we come upon an obstacle, we look at it and we figure out a way around it or over it, under it. At times, we do have to take it out and make enough room to be able to get by. Yeah, I guess. Well, oh, there you go. We started off with, with uh, bow saws and hand saws. And uh, then, since it, 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 there was so much stuff that had to be cleared, just couldn't get it done with that, we went to chainsaws. But we went to battery-powered chainsaw. No worry about oil, no worry about gas or anything like that. You're not doing this with the idea of going swimming, but... No, you definitely want to be prepared because, like they say, we're all in between swims. If you're going to be in that water for any extended amount of time, you better have thermal protection. Three millimeter wetsuit, dressed for immersion. <laughs> if you're going to go in, you're going to know it. Three miles to go, about an hour, hour and a half, and we should be on our way home. South Jersey, what did people think about? It's flat, you know? But when you go out here and you go through the valleys and you look up and it's not 10 feet, not 20 feet, you're talking, you have some, some valleys that are 50 feet high that you go through over the years with the waterways clearing them. I mean, it's a whole nother environment, you know, ecosystem than people are used to seeing in South Jersey. It's just wonderful to be able to see that. What is it you like about paddling the sun here? Oh, the paddling is the, the, the combination of the nature, the, the, the wildlife you can see. Didn't see as much today as you normally did, but saw some stuff. And the people coming out with people from all over the area. Great to have all these members who are willing to help and participate to make this happen. Wonderful conditions today. Mother Nature cooperated. The, uh, the colors that you have, even though we're probably peak or just past peak now, especially at this time of year with the trees, the colors, and then we were rained on today, not by rain, but by leaves. Today was a fantastic fall paddle for South Jersey. Can't have a better day than today. What a 
beautiful way to spend a day. And speaking of a beautiful way to spend a day, we're going to take a tour around Fort Mifflin plus go sky high with our armed forces when we return. <laughs> We're still hanging out here at Fort Mifflin, home of so much American military history, but also you can see Philadelphia International Airport is right there, and that's a perfect segue for our next story. Do you know that the U.S. Armed Forces is celebrating 100 years of mid-air refueling? That's right. They just refuel right in the middle of the flight. And our photojournalist and National Guardsman George Roach got a close-up look at the 100th anniversary celebrations. Piedmont, 59, uh, 53, just to be advised, there's a D-130 on golf, going to be turning on echo. So it looks easy. I assure you it's not always easy, and every day is different. Runway heading, runway 13, clear for takeoff. Runway heading, 13, clear for takeoff. What makes it routine to the mind's eye is the capacity to train many, many, many hours. Today was an opportunity for us to highlight uh, a capability that the Air Force projects over the past 100 years. Today was an, an air refueling training mission. Uh, we do several of those to practice for uh, the real world event. Without practice, you don't get good at your craft. Exec at 335 with their student. Today you saw one of our EC-130J, soon to be MC-130J aircraft, air refuel from a KC-135 tanker aircraft from Pittsburgh. Yes, you're coming up on it has evolved considerably over the past 100 years from uh, a couple airplanes and a hose, uh, gravity feeding 75 gallons of fuel from one airplane to the other uh, into the, the capabilities that you saw today with uh, the boom operations and um, thousands of pounds of offload capability uh, to a single aircraft. We're 50 feet from the, uh, from the tanker aircraft. Uh, down to zero. We're actually contacting the aircraft in flight. So it extends our range and our capability. It provides global reach for the U.S. Air Force. Check out. It's a whole team effort every day, and it's diversity of experience and, and background and knowledge that makes us so effective in what we do. Uh, it's different ways to look at problems and problem solve that make us prepared for the next 100 years of air refueling. This will be a good one. Yep. All right, now I'm joined by Beth here. She's executive director here at Fort Mifflin. And this is an incredible spot that might be a little bit of a hidden gem here in Philadelphia. Tell me the history of this place. For sure. Fort Mifflin is probably the most heroic uh, historic site that you've never heard of. It was constructed by the British in the early 1770s to defend Philadelphia, which was one of the wealthiest seaports in the Western world, but in American hands by the time of the American Revolution. Held under siege for uh, heroically for almost six weeks in the fall of 1777, giving George Washington the time to get to Valley Forge. That was the winter that changed the war. Von Steuben came and trained the troops. The French joined the cause with a checkbook and a navy. There goes an airplane. Um, so what the army that emerges from Valley Forge in the spring of 1778 is very different from the army that arrived at Valley Forge in the fall of 1777. So although the British destroyed the entire site um, during the siege and bombardment in 1777, it was reconstructed and it was garrisoned for the War of 1812. It was a federal prison during the Civil War, a naval munitions depot, a Marine Corps barracks, even wired for anti-aircraft batteries during World War II. Wow. Decommissioned 1954, at which point it was the longest serving military installation in the entire country. So Fort Mifflin's really a three century veteran of service to the United States. That is incredible. And it's all just right here in our backyard. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned some of the heroes of some of these past wars. 
some of them might still be lingering around here? So we have an entire garrison of permanent residents, or our unseen co-workers, as we call them. We're on every list of the most haunted sites in the country, and we invite people to come and experience it for themselves. Um, during Halloween, obviously, we do a lot of programming, but we do this paranormal investigation-type programming year-round, including one coming up uh, in early December. That is amazing. You're so close to the airport. How can people find you, and what are the hours of operation here. So we're open every Wednesday to Sunday from 10 to 4. Um, our website, which is fortmifflin.us, if you click on planning your trip, there's uh, printed driving directions, or you can just put Fort Mifflin into your GPS system. Beth, have you ever seen an unseen coworker? I have not seen any unseen coworkers, <laughs> um, but I've heard them. I'm not particularly sensitive to Ooh. the energy, which maybe is a good thing, mm -hmm. but I now have a friend who says hello to me every once in a while when I get out of the car. Oh, how how creepy, <laughs> spooky for you. I but, love you know, that. it's funny, the first time it happened, I wasn't even freaked out because I thought it was a real person. <laughs> <laughs> So, but it is not. Just, just your little coworker just from beyond. Just my unseen coworker. Um, also, there's a. You can shoot a cannon. Here. We have a special event, Black Powder Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. Stay out of the mall. Come explore our weapons programs here, and for a, a donation, we allow visitors. A donation and a waiver. Um, we allow yeah. visitors to fire the cannon as well, and we hope that you <laughs> will have a go at it today. Ooh! All right. Well, on that note, you know what? I'm gonna get my cannon ready for you guys and we'll be right back with more 215 after this short time out. We are gonna light this cannon in a little bit. I'm so excited, I've never done anything even remotely close to this. Um, but before we do, let's take a look at a 215 flashback fave. Come on, Booby. Come on, Booby. My name is Peter Jam. I'm originally from Beirut. Booby! I wake up every single morning with the prayer of uh, inspiring a dog or a person and creating a positive drop, you know, somewhere. If you want love, you will get love. If people, uh, they watch this video, they think that I have uh, planned for it in years, in months, but I will just tell you that it was just an idea. It just came to my mind. It was like conceive, believe, and achieve. And I can tell you that you can do the same thing or even bigger in your schools, in your universities, in your society, and uh, we can get the peace message out there. Time is now. What gave you the passion to, to teach peace education and to chase peace? I am a three-generational survival. My grandfather was a survivor of the Armenian genocide. My father was born in Jerusalem, Old City Jerusalem, in the Armenian convent. I was born in the midst of the civil war in the 80s in Lebanon. That's why I'm so much dedicated into nonviolence. What God has given me as a talent of songwriting and playing music, why would I put in it this universal message of peace and inspi inspiring through the message of nonviolence and go around like, you know, different countries and sing for them? You can be black or white, red, blue, green, yellow, orange. It was a dream for me to travel and play my peace song. I started with a couple of cities in, in Europe and ended up with 40 countries around the world. Yes. You got peace. How do you tie all this stuff that you do together? From the music to the peace ambassador to the the dog psychology. There is love. A relationship approach, it can be actually uh, applied from human to human. Love. We can incorporate this way of living, let's say, that we are embracing each other regardless of um, uh, different genders, ethnicities, uh, colors. You can be loved as white as Buddhist, Muslim or Christian. Every single breath that I take, I always think of uh, how I can be um, a, 
uh, a person that's pushing our society for a betterment. Yeah, you will get peace if you want to hope. thing up. I'm super pumped. It's a little tiny, but don't you worry. It packs a punch. All right, okay. Olga. Like How that? do I do this? Do I just put it on here? First, we let everybody know. Okay. Fire in the hole. Fire in the hole. Thank you so very much for joining us on the 215. We'll be back same place, same time next week. Right there. Ready? Yep. All right. Is it going? <laughs> 